everyone, it's Jessica Pock from Mirror Lake. Thanks for tuning in today. If you missed yesterday's read aloud, don't worry. We started The Watcher, Jane Goodall's Life with the Chimps by Jeanette Winter. It's a true nonfiction book about a woman named Jane Goodall. And yesterday we read that she finally got to travel to Tanzania to go study chimpanzees after dreaming about it since she was a little girl. So before we continue uh, reading the story, let's see what our target is today. Um, so having a learning target or a goal or a focus is great to keep in mind while you're reading or listening to a story. So today we're going to work on inflectional endings. Here's our target. I will uh, look for inflectional endings, E-D, I-E-D, so with that focus. An inflectional ending is a group of letters added to the end of a word to change its meaning. So the one we're focused on today again is ED and IED. When added to certain words, it means that it happened in the past. So let's use these examples. Again, if, I, if you have the word guess first, we add ED, then it changes to guest, which happened in the past. Um, and then if you have the word watched, again, we use the word watched, add the ED at the end, and that means it happened in the past. For example, I watched my favorite movie last night with my family and it was super fun. The tricky one is the IED. So sometimes when there is a word that ends in Y, um, you add the IED to it for the spelling. For example, carry, instead of the Y, you, chain, you take that out and add the IED to it. But the inflectional ending is still meaning the same thing that it happened in the past. So carry becomes carried and you see that the IED is in place of the Y. So another example could be the word hurry. Again, do we just add the YED to it? Hmm. So I'm looking at that rule again with the Y. I know that'll change to hurried. So get rid of the Y, H-U-R-R, -R, then change that to IED and now you have hurried. He hurried home because he didn't want to get caught in the rain. Um, so something like that. So we want to look out for those while we're reading today and look for that in our story. So let's continue reading The Watcher, Jane Goodall's Life with the Chimps. Again, let's look for those inflectional endings, E-D and I-E-D. Jane walked down into the forest, hoping a chimp would appear. Still, the cautious chimp stayed hidden. Secretly, they watched Jane. When will I see a chimp, she wondered. And whoa, already, now that I'm focused and have a goal, I see so many inflectional endings. There's the E-D there, walked. And then here, watched, ED at the end, and then the word wondered. If you wanted to make a chart, go ahead. Um, but also just keeping track of those words is great too. And again, that means it happened in the past. Then Jane fell uh, ill with malaria. That means she got sick. Lying in her tent, burning with fever, she almost lost hope. But when the fever left her body, she tried again to get close to the chimps. More weeks and months passed, till one day the chimps let Jane see them. She stayed in the background, never hid, acted uninterested, and quietly watched. Man, there's a lot of um, ED inflectional endings that I see here. So again, that means it happened already, uninterested, watched again, passed there. So when, you're, when you have a focus, it's nice to kind of look for those when you're reading. Now Jane watched every day, all day, even huddled in the rain. She saw the chimps accept the rain, not look for shelter as we do. And she kept notes about it all. You have to be patient if you want to learn about animals, she wrote. Some nights Jane even slept on the peak to be near the tree where the chimps are sleeping. She woke at dawn and saw them slowly rise from their nests, sit for a spell, then go off to find food. She is dedicated and she's sleeping out with them um, just so she can not miss anything. Jane named the chimps. To her, each one was different, just like us. A gray bearded chimp was the first to approach Jane. She named him David Graybeard. David Graybeard has, yes, he has taken bananas from my hand. So gently, no snatching, she wrote. 
That would be pretty cool to do in the wild. David Greybeard let Jane come close. She watched him shape a stick into a tool to dig for termites. Before this, nobody knew that wild animals made tools. She watched David Greybeard eat meat. Before this, everybody thought chimps ate only plants. So again, looking for those. I see that um, ED ending a lot. And man, she is learning so much about the chimps just by being quiet and watching. And because David Greybeard trusted Jane, now the other chimps let Jane come close too. Chimps all around me, what a day. Chimps near, chimps far, old men, young men, ladies, children, babies, teenagers, the lot, she wrote. How cool. Jane watched the chimps when they were happy. She saw them hold hands and hug and kiss and laugh just like us. There she is taking notes on their behavior. Jane watched the chimps when they were angry or scared and their hair stood on end. She saw them swagger and throw tantrums and kept out of the way. I'm going to stop right there. So you'll have to tune in tomorrow to see how the story ends. Um, but I just want to recap what we just did. Um, our goal again, our target was I will look for inflectional endings, ED and IED. And there were a ton of ED. I didn't see a lot of IED, but that's okay. Um, and so I just wanted to leave you with this. So if we had some examples here, like the word cry, um, remember with the if it ends in a Y, um, we have to add the IED to it. So would we just add ED or IED? And remember, we take out that Y. So think of that in your head. And if you got C-R-I-E-D, then you got it right. So then again, that means it happened in the past. Um, so try, try. Would it be try with the ED or would we take out the Y and add the IED? Think about that for a second. And let's see if you got that tried. That's right, we took out the Y and added the IED to make it uh, add that inflectional ending and that meant it um, happened in the past. So I have one kind of tricky one where I want you to tell me what would the example have been, the original example here, sorry. Um, so the word that has already has the ending is the word helped. Um, so what word do you see in there that the example word would have been just the word help? And again, there's no IED because it didn't end in a Y. Hi guys, so if you joined us um, the previous days, we have completed um, a paragraph, an opinion paragraph. Um, I have the target right up here. I will revise my opinion paragraph by using ARMS. If you haven't heard of ARMS, it's a great acronym to help you remember um, how to revise something. So I have what I wrote um, on the graphic organizer, the Orio, and now I just typed it. I think that's a little easier for me and for you to see so you don't have to wait for me to write. Um, so revising down here, you're making, I'm trying to make my paragraph even better now. So here's what ARMS stands for. A is add sentences or words, okay? R is remove words, that means take some words out. M is move words, so I can move words or sentences around. And then S is substitute words or sentences. That means maybe I find a better word that I can use for this instead. So I want to revise this paragraph. Again, this is exactly what I did yesterday in the graphic organizer. Um, these were just separated out. This was the O, this was the R, this is the E. See how those words are all still there. I just typed it up. So I'm not, I'm. some of you might notice, hey, Ms. Pock, you spelled some stuff wrong. Um, today, I'm not focused on that. I'm going to try my best to ignore it um, because revision is something that I want to focus on for today. I'm listening to my words and remember that the point of this is to, I'm trying to convince my parents for me to get a dog. So I really want to sell it. Um, and I think I can add more or maybe change some things or add some more sentences to make this even stronger. So, so far I have, in my opinion, I believe I should have a pet dog. Right now, um, I'm trying to think of, hmm, how else can I write that? Um, to make it really strong. 
And again, I'm not worried about spelling right now. That's for editing tomorrow. Um, I believe I'm going to add in here. So I'm going to try and do that in purple so you can see what I'm adding. Um, I believe I am ready to, and I'm going to take that out, have a oops, pet dog. Okay, I think that's a little better than I should have a dog. Um, and here's, I want to go ahead and prove to my parents I am ready. So here I am using the A of revising, just making my paragraph even stronger now. I'm ready to have a pet dog. So one reason is because I'm responsible. I want to add um, a little more to that. Notice I'm going sentence by sentence right now because, boy, this is a lot to do, all this revision. I'm going to kind of focus on one thing. Is there a word I need to remove? Not really in this sentence. Um, or move around or substitute. I think I want to focus on adding more to this sentence. That's the A in revise. So one reason is because I am responsible. Um, I'm going to add... I am um, responsible for many reasons. Um, I, again, I want to make sure that uh, my parents know that I'm serious about having a pet dog. So I actually want to give them more than just one reason why. Um, is because I'm responsible for many reasons. Actually, you know what? I'm looking at that now. I see the word reason, and then I see the word reason here again. That's a lot of reasons in one sentence. So I'm actually going to just revise what I just did. If you had this on paper, you can cross that off or erase it. I am responsible. Uh, I'm going to write in many ways instead of for many reasons. So I'm going to reread that to myself. One reason is because I am responsible in many ways. Now, that's much better than reasons, reasons. Um, now I need to make sure that I have those examples um, down. So I know for sure I'm going to have to add more to this. So here's my next sentence. One example is when I was younger, I fed the fish. Okay, is that really showing responsibility? I think I could... Um, add a little more to what I'm talking about here to make sure my parents, again, my parents, I want to convince them that I am totally ready for a pet dog. So I'm thinking of what I could, um, I'm going to actually go ahead and substitute um, or move this around a little bit, change the color, is... When we had a pet fish, um, I kind of think I fed the fish every day. So I'm going to go ahead and delete that and then make that purple so you know um, that this is what I have revised and changing it. We had a pet fish, I fed the fish every day. I'm going to add on to this because I feel like my parents are going to say, so what? Who cares? That doesn't show that you're responsible. Um, you, because I know I'm talking to my mom and dad, you never had to remind me to feed, to feed the fish. I just did it all by myself. And that was when I was six years old. And then now I could say, now I'm blank years old. I'm not going to tell you my age right now. But now I'm this old, and I um, am even more responsible. So then going to another reason is, um, I will walk the dog. Again, hmm, I'm going to ignore my mistakes of the spelling and everything or the capitalizations. Um, but I want to, again, revise this and add some more or remove. Is I will walk the dog. I actually think that's okay, um, but again, I want to sell myself and um, show that I'm super responsible. So I want to really add to this next one. For example, I will walk every day in the rain. So instead of just ending there, I'm going to go ahead and add way more to this um, to show my parents that I am so ready for a dog. For example, I will walk every day, even in the rain. 
um, you, again, my mom and dad, will never have to walk the dog because I will make sure to take care of him. Just going to pretend that it's a, um, a him right now. Um, and maybe kind of like Alex did in I Wanna Iguana, kind of suck up a little bit. That means um, trying to get on their really good side because I really want this pet dog and I want them to trust me and um, know that they know that I'm going to be super responsible. So you will never have to, I'm reading what I have, you will never have to walk the dog because I will make sure to take care of him. I'm going to say again, you are so busy working so hard all the time. Um, the time I will do my part for the family. Ooh, I know my parents are going to like that. I will do my part for the family and make sure the dog is healthy um, by walking him. So I'm again taking a look at what I already have. Look how much longer this already got. Um, when you're writing it, the length isn't super important, but notice that, hey, this has more meat now. Um, it's going to be stronger, making sure I'm still staying on topic, but just going sentence by sentence and adding a little more detail and examples. So I'm going to go back and read that because I just was talking and blabbing and writing. I want to make sure this makes sense. Another reason is I will walk the dog. For example, I will walk every day, even in the rain. You will never have to walk the dog because I will make sure to take care of him. Okay, I'm okay with that. You are so busy working so hard all the time. Again, I'm trying to butter up my parents. I will do my part for the family and make sure the dog is healthy. All right, so I added one, two, oh, I added two whole long sentences um, to my example and explain right there, proving again that I am responsible. All in all, these are the reasons I think I should have a pet fish. Uh-oh, hold on. Did I want a pet fish this whole time? Um, something that a lot of students tend to do sometimes and cross that off right away so I don't forget is, hey, I talked about fish up here, but make sure you know what you're talking about. I, do I want a pet fish or do I want a pet dog? I hope you said dog. Um, so I'm going to make sure to change that. Again, that's the R in, um, in arms. I want a pet dog and make sure I... Don't worry about the spelling or the um, capitalizations right now. We will work on that tomorrow. Awesome job, guys. Thanks for helping. you third grade mathematicians out there. Welcome back. We are talking about multiplication this week and learning some strategies for solving multiplication problems. And today we are going to learn a new strategy and we're going to connect it to the strategies that we've already practiced and learned about. So today's strategy is called skip counting. 
Another way people talk about this strategy is um, saying we're count, doing count buys or counting by a certain number. So our learning target today is I can use skip counting to solve multiplication equations. And skip counting really just means we are counting by sort of adding on in our heads. And we're not saying every single number as we count. When we learn how to count, when we're first in school in kindergarten, and we start with counting, we're learning to count starting with one and going up by ones. So we count one, two, three, four, five, and so on. When we skip count, we're not saying every single number in between. We're skipping some numbers and we're sort of counting in groups. So that connects to multiplication because we know multiplication is all about putting equal groups together. So today we're gonna learn how we can look at a multiplication equation and skip count to solve and find the answer or the total. We're also going to look at how we can connect our skip counting to repeated addition, which is the strategy we learned in our last lesson. And we can even see how skip counting can connect to an array that matches a multiplication equation, which we talked about in our first lesson. So I'm excited to get started and I'll get ready with the whiteboard. Here is our whiteboard with our learning target again to remind you that we're working on skip counting today to solve a multiplication equation. And remember, since multiplication is just equal groups being put together to find a total, just think of skip counting as counting by groups of one of the numbers in a multiplication equation. That's really all we're doing. <clears throat> I also today wanna remind you some of the words, the important vocabulary words that we've been using and that we need to know and understand when we're exploring multiplication. So of course, multiplication, remembering what that means, that it's putting equal groups together to find a total. Equal just means that we have the same amount or value or number in each of the groups. Last time, I taught you the word product, and that's just what we call the answer to a multiplication equation. When we find the total, that's the product. The other word that we talked about in our first lesson that's important to remember is what an array is. And that's just a special type of math picture that we use in multiplication. And it shows our equal groups in rows and columns. So in straight lines going across and in straight lines going up and down. So on our screen, we see our familiar fact. We've worked with this equation a couple of times now, two times four, which we know just means we're thinking about two groups of four. And I also drew an array here showing, I decided to show two columns of four, two lines going up and down of four dots in each one. And last time we worked on repeated addition. So I want to show you that repeated addition equation we might use to solve two times four. I'm gonna write this one where we're adding two to itself four times. And the reason I wanna show that repeated addition sentence is because I want you to think about a number we could count by, we could skip count by to solve two times four. Now, I know some of you might have had practice with counting by twos before, and some of you might not have had practice counting by twos. So let's talk about how we count by twos or skip count in order to solve this problem two times four. When we count by twos, it's kind of like we're saying every other number out loud. So we always start, by the way, with the number that we're counting by. That's always the first number we're going to say. So if we're counting by twos, 
we're going to say we're going to start with two. And let me use a different color here. We know how many twos we're counting by looking at the other number in our equation. So in this case, we're going to count by twos four times. So what that means is in my head, I'm going to start with two. And then I'm going to add on two more and think about what number would come next if I started with two and added another group of two. I would say four next. So we start with two and then we go four. And if I add two more in my head, four plus two more would get me to six. And I do the same thing one more time. I add on two to six, and I would get eight. So this is one example of how I could count by twos to solve two times four. I use two times four because we've already solved this equation. So we know the answer. And I just want to show and connect this new strategy to how we can use it to find our answer. So again, we're count, we decided to count by twos to solve this one, or I decided to count by twos. I'm hoping most of us know how to count by twos and we have practice with it. But if you don't, it's a great thing to practice anytime you can at home, counting by twos. And there's other numbers we can practice counting by that also will help us with multiplication, like counting by fives, counting by tens, and so on. So today we're looking at an example where we're counting by twos. So to figure out two times four, it's like I'm saying four twos and adding two on each time in my head. Starting with two, four, six, eight. So if I count by two four times, I get to eight. We'll do another example so you can see another way to think about counting bys. I want to also show you how in our array, we can see those twos as we go down. So if I wanted to, I could count this first row of two. Whoops, I'm going to erase that part. It's kind of sloppy. Get more clear. So what I was going to show you is how to connect our skip counting to the array that matches this equation for two times four. So here I've got my four rows of two or my two columns of four. Remember a column just means a straight line going up and down. And I just wanna count next to each of the rows to show you that skip counting we just did and how it connects to our array. So in the first row of my array, I just see two dots. If I were to cover up all the rest of the dots, I would only have two. And then when I add on that next row, I now have four dots all together in my array. If I add the next two, I now see that there are six in my array. And the last count I do is those adding on those last two in the array and we have a total of eight. So that's just to show you how I can use skip counting and connect it with my array. As I look at the rows, I'm counting and adding on each of those groups until I get to the bottom of the array and I see all of them together. And that last number I say when I'm skip counting is my answer or my product. So in this case, we solved two times four, by counting two, four, six, eight. And after we say those four twos, we see the total is eight. Example of a multiplication equation that we could solve by using skip counting. And this time we're going to solve a new equation. So this time we're thinking about five times three. And just to remind you how we start when we think about multiplication, 
If we have five times three, that means we're thinking about five groups of three or three groups of five. We can think about what that would look like if we drew a picture. So let's go ahead and draw that real quick. Uh, I wanna draw an array, since that's a good picture for us to practice. Let's draw an array that shows three rows with five dots in each row. So, and my array is not perfectly straight, but hopefully you're able to still see those three rows of five pretty clearly. When I look at my array, I notice in the top row, I have five. And so I'm already starting to think about what I could count by to solve this and figure out what the total for all those three rows of five would be together. I'm also remembering last time the strategy we learned, which was repeated addition. And I wanna think about how I could maybe write a repeated addition sentence that would help us solve this. I could do five plus five plus five. So hopefully you're seeing, I'm gonna rewrite that so it's a little neater. But hopefully you're seeing that maybe the number that would be easiest for us to count by would be five. I also said before that I know some of you have practice with counting by certain numbers like twos and fives, and some of us don't. What's cool about counting by fives is once you get the hang of it, it's easy to remember because when we count by fives, there's a pattern that happens. And I think you'll see that when we try that with this example. So if I wanted to count by fives to solve five times three, I could think about starting with five and we can come back to that array that we drew and writing next to each row as we're adding on another group, how much we have. So the very first row, we just see five dots. And if I, in my head, add on that next row of five, the next number I would say would be 10. So when we count by fives, we start with five, then we say 10, and if I add on five more in my head, I know 10 plus five equals 15. So we could say five, 10, 15, and when I skip count by fives three times, I can figure out that the total would be 15. I was mentioning that there's a pattern when you count by fives, so I just wanna point that out. If I were to keep going, maybe you can see the pattern. Make some room down here. So we start with five, and then we say 10, 15, and next, if we added five more, that's right, it would be 20. If I added five more, it would be 25. So hopefully you're seeing there's this pattern of in our ones place, we either have a five or a zero and it alternates. So we count by fives, there's a rhythm and a pattern to it. Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, next would be 30, then 35 and so on. So that's just to show you that when we count by fives, if you practice, you start to remember them pretty easily because there is a pattern that follows. So here is one more example. We talked about how to use counting by twos in the last example to solve two times four. And in this example, we can count by fives three times, five, 10, 15, to solve five times three, and we get the total of 15. So I'm showing an equation, we've seen this one before, but today I want you to get a chance to solve this using the new strategy that we talked about today, which is skip counting. First, you might need to go grab a paper and a pencil 
Or you can also do this by just skip counting out loud and using your fingers to keep track. But try skip counting to solve two times six. And since we earlier looked at an example where we counted by twos because one of the numbers in our equation was two, that might be a good number to count by for this example. I'll give you a few seconds to try counting by twos to solve two times six, and then we'll talk about the answer. Okay, hopefully you got a chance to try on your own, counting by twos to figure out two times six. I'm going to draw an array as I count by twos to solve this one. So here's one row of two. So I'll say two, four, six, eight, 10, there's five twos, 12 would be six twos. And let me go ahead and I'll write the numbers I said next to those rows again so you can see. Two, four, six, eight, 10, and 12 is our total for two groups of six or six groups of two. Okay, how did you do? Let's try one more on your own. And this time we'll do an example with five in case you wanna practice counting by fives. So try solving five times five with skip counting by fives. And remember, you always start with five, if that's what you're counting by. So there's a row of five. You could draw an array while you're skip counting, or you could use your fingers. Okay, go ahead and try skip counting by fives five times to find the total. All right, are you ready to see if you did it? Five, 10, 15, 20, and five rows of five would be 25 altogether. So there's our answer. How did you do? So that's all for today. That was our learning target on skip using skip counting to solve multiplication equations. For next time, we'll do some practice with solving real world problems that involve multiplication. And we'll use some of those strategies we learned in the last three lessons. Thanks again for joining me and I'll see you next time, math thinkers. Niños y niñas, soy yo, la maestra Lorena Vázquez, con ustedes de nuevo aquí para aprender matemáticas juntos. Esta semana nos hemos estado enfocando en la multiplicación 
que como ya saben, multiplicación es combinar grupos iguales. Y hemos estado aprendiendo que la multiplicación se puede representar de diferentes maneras, como sumas repetidas, grupos iguales, una matriz y hasta una ecuación. El día de hoy nos vamos a enfocar en representar la multiplicación con una matriz. Entonces, la palabra del día es matriz. Cuando ustedes escuchen que yo diga la palabra del día, ustedes van a repetir matriz, filas y columnas. ¿Escucharon bien? Una vez más, matriz, filas y columnas. ¿Listos? Vamos a comenzar. Bueno, niños y niñas, vamos a comenzar. Ayer, si recuerdan, estuvimos enfocados específicamente en la estrategia de utilizar conjuntos, que ya dijimos, conjuntos, grupos iguales de objetos para multiplicar. Entonces, su trabajo era poder dibujar los grupos iguales para comprobar su trabajo. Entonces, vamos a ver, por ahí recuerdo que les encargué una tarea para que intentaran ustedes solos. Así que vamos a ver. La primera fue dos grupos de seis. Y la segunda, cinco grupos de cuatro. ¿Qué tal? ¿Pudieron hacerlo ustedes solitos? Vamos a ver cómo les quedó y les voy a mostrar un ejemplo de cómo podríamos resolverlo. Damos aquí la cortina. Muy bien. Recuerdo que ayer les estaba diciendo que pueden utilizar cualquier objeto para, para hacer grupos iguales. En este caso, yo estoy usando una imagen de rocas. Entonces, Debo de hacer dos grupos de seis y como pueden ver, aquí hay un grupo de seis y para comprobar vamos a contarlos. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis. Y aquí está el segundo grupo de seis. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis. Entonces, este método implica que estamos colectando los objetos, contando cuánto necesitamos y agrupándolos en los dos grupos o los grupos necesarios. Otra manera que pueden hacerlo, especialmente cuando están resolviendo problemas y no pueden hacerlos mentalmente y necesitan una ayuda visual, a mí me gusta a veces empezar con la cantidad de grupos. En este caso, yo les dije, hagan un uh, dibujo de cinco grupos de cuatro. Entonces, como pueden ver, ya dibujé los cinco grupos. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco. Ahora lo único que necesito hacer es dentro de cada uno poner cuatro objetos. Podría usar corazones, círculos, estrellitas, pero si estoy haciendo trabajo en clase y no tengo tiempo de estar dibujando corazoncitos, lo que puedo hacer es simplemente usar puntos. Vamos a hacer cuatro en cada grupo. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. Muy bien, así es una manera rápida y eficaz de hacer un dibujo de grupos iguales o conjuntos de cinco grupos con cuatro objetos en cada uno. ¿Qué tal les fue? ¿Lo hicieron correctamente? Estoy segura que sí. Vamos a continuar con la lección de hoy. Así que hoy ya, ya hemos repasado sumas repetidas. Ya ayer estudiamos grupos iguales. Nuestro enfoque hoy va a ser en esta sección de aquí que viene siendo, estoy aprendiendo a multiplicar utilizando una matriz. ¿Han escuchado esa palabra anteriormente? Matriz. Cuando yo la escuché por primera vez, me quedé sorprendida porque me recordaba otras cosas que podían significar matriz. Pero en este caso, una matriz es ordenar objetos en filas y columnas para multiplicar. Y ese es su objetivo el día de hoy. Entonces, cuando yo diga matriz, porque esta va a ser nuestra palabra del día, ustedes van a repetir matriz y van a decir filas y columnas. Vamos a intentarlo. Matriz. Matriz. Pilas y columnas. Excelente trabajo. Así que estén atentos. Cada vez que yo diga la palabra del día, ustedes van a responder con la misma palabra y filas y columnas. Recuerden, pueden usar lápiz y papel o una pizarra con marcador. Y si tienen objetos que ustedes pueden contar y agrupar y ordenar en filas y columnas, pueden utilizar esos también. 
vamos a empezar con nuestro primer ejemplo. Así que tenemos aquí la palabra. Matriz. Matriz, pilas y columnas. Muy bien. ¿Cuántos grupos de o cuánto por cuánto? En esta primera imagen pueden ver que regresaron las ranitas del día 1. ¿Cuántas ranitas tenemos? ¿Cuántas filas y cuántas columnas? Las filas en una matriz son horizontales. Pueden hacer esto conmigo, horizontal. Y las columnas son verticales. Entonces, las filas nos dicen cuántos grupos hay. ¿Cuántos grupos? Así que vamos a contar las filas. Una fila, dos filas, tres filas. En este caso hay tres grupos. Las columnas nos dice cuántos hay dentro de los grupos. Entonces, en la cantidad de columnas viene siendo igual que la cantidad de uh, la cantidad dentro de cada grupo. Así que vamos a ver. Una y dos. En este caso, cada fila o cada grupo tiene dos ranitas. Entonces, súper fácil, ¿no creen? Tres grupos de dos. Y si lo vamos a poner aquí en una expresión de multiplicación, sería igual. Tres grupos de dos. Tres por dos. Niños, tener las ranas aquí en una fila bien ordenaditas les ayuda a resolver este problema. ¿Cuánto es la respuesta? Tres por dos es igual a qué? Tres grupos de dos es igual a qué? Vamos a ver, podemos contar de dos en dos porque eso ya sabemos hacer. Dos, cuatro, seis. Si todavía no sabes contar de dos en dos, puedes contar individualmente. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis. Así que la respuesta de tres grupos de dos es seis. Este se llama el producto. ¿Puedes decir esa palabra? Producto. A ver, niños, vamos a tomar una pequeña pausa para explorar este concepto de tres grupos de dos, tres por dos igual a seis. Vamos a decir que las ranitas en nuestra matriz, matriz, pilas y columnas, no se quedaran en tres filas de dos, sino que saltaron por todos rumbos y se movieron de posición. Y ahora si miran aquí, tenemos una fila, Dos filas, ¿verdad? Vamos a contarlas otra vez. Una, dos filas. Entonces serían dos grupos de, ¿cuántas columnas hay? Vamos a ver, ¿cuántas columnas tenemos por aquí? Una, dos, tres. Mm, interesante. Así que ahora tenemos dos por Tres. Así que tenemos aquí, vamos a ver, dos por tres. Ahora ya sabemos que el producto de tres por dos es seis. ¿Importa si las filas y las columnas están volteadas? Vamos a ver cuál es el producto, en este caso, de dos Grupos de tres. A ver, podemos contar de tres en tres. Tres, seis. O igual podemos contar las columnas de dos en dos. Dos, cuatro, seis. Niños, ¿qué descubrimos? El producto de dos grupos de tres es seis. Exactamente lo mismo que el producto de tres grupos de dos. ¿Qué concepto tan interesante? Eso quiere decir que cuando estamos multiplicando, ya sea en una matriz, matriz, pilas y columnas, o en grupos iguales, o en una ecuación, o este, 
en cualquier forma, los grupos, el orden de los grupos y de las filas, o las columnas, o los factores, no importa. El producto siempre va a ser el mismo. Algo que deben de tener en mente porque les va a ayudar después cuando estén estudiando y memorizándose sus tablas de multiplicación. OK, vamos a continuar con nuestra lección. Vamos a ver el segundo ejemplo. El segundo ejemplo viene siendo, ahora en vez de darles el dibujo, les, doy, les estoy dando las cantidades. En este ejemplo, quiero cuatro grupos de tres o cuatro por tres. Así que yo voy a elegir las estrellas porque yo estoy segura que todos ustedes en casa son unas superestrellas que están practicando y trabajando duro. Así que, ¿cuántas filas necesito? Cuatro. Para mí se me hace más fácil acomodar las filas primero y luego las columnas para saber cuántas necesito poner en cada fila. Así que vamos a hacer esto. Primera fila, una. Segunda fila, dos. Tercera fila, tres. Y cuatro. Cuatro filas, cuatro filas de estrellitas. Ahora, sabemos que las columnas nos dice cuántos hay en cada grupo. ¿Y cuántas columnas necesitamos? Tres columnas. Pero fíjense, ya tenemos la primera columna. Aquí está. Recuerden, en una matriz, matriz, filas y columnas, las filas son horizontales y las columnas son verticales. Así que ya tenemos una columna vertical. Ahora tenemos que agregar dos más. A ver, vamos a hacer la primera. Fila 2. Fila 3 y fila número 4. Ahora tengo una columna vertical, dos columnas verticales. Necesito una más. Una, dos, tres filas y en la cuarta fila. Muy bien, niños y niñas. Ahora aquí tenemos, tenemos una matriz. Matriz. Filas y columnas. Excelente, no se olvidaron. De estrellitas que muestra cuatro filas. Una, dos, tres y cuatro. Y a la vez también muestra tres columnas. Una, dos, tres. Muy bien. Entonces, ¿alguien sabe la respuesta? ¿Cuántos son cuatro grupos de tres? ¿Cuánto será cuatro por tres? Hmm. Tomen un segundo y piensen esa respuesta. Si la tienen, pueden compartirla con alguien que esté viendo este video con ustedes o pueden escribirla en su pizarra o hoja de papel. Vamos a ver. Igual a... Si ustedes dijeron que la respuesta es 12... Acertaron. 4 por 3 son 12. Uh, este 2 no me salió, niños. Muy bien. Me falló mi lápiz mágico. 12. Excelente trabajo. Ajá, no hemos terminado. Vamos a ver. Tengo algo para ustedes. Para mañana, quiero que ahora que hemos practicado juntos, Quiero que ahora lo intenten ustedes solos. Así que tomen su pizarra, su marcador, o toquen su lápiz y papel y apunten este problema que quiero que ustedes representen en una matriz. Matriz, filas y columnas. Muy bien, niños. El primero es dos grupos de cinco. Recuerden, el dos representa las filas y el cinco representa las columnas, 2 por 5. Lo más importante de una matriz, matriz, filas y columnas. Muy bien. Es que las filas y las columnas estén rectas, derechitas, y no por todos rumbos. Y que las, los objetos estén en una orden. ¿OK? Tomen en cuenta de eso. El segundo problema que quiero que intenten solitos, y mañana lo vamos a comprobar juntos, es seis grupos de tres o 
6 por 3. A ver si pueden contestar y encontrar el producto o la respuesta. Muy bien, niños, hemos llegado al final de nuestra lección y estoy muy contenta de que hoy estuvimos aprendiendo a multiplicar utilizando una matriz. Matriz, pilas y columnas. Muy bien. Espero que hayan logrado poder ordenar objetos en filas y columnas para multiplicar. Ahora les doy un adelanto que el día de mañana vamos a estar aprendiendo a multiplicar usando una ecuación. Entonces, aquí los espero el día de mañana y que tengan buenas tardes. Adiós.